you can learn a lot about life on the Big Island of Hawaii. What sustains it? And how today is everything until it's over. How it can be rejuvenated to reveal what's deep inside. And how boundaries are made to be broken. Those lessons come here in an event called the Iron Man. 1,800 people united by the challenge to prove, to inspire, to finish a once thought to be unreachable distance. Most of them are you and me. I am a plumber, firefighter, teacher, a lawyer, a marine, FBI, pharmacist, hair color, waitress, massage therapist. I'm a nun. Tomorrow, I go back to being a foreign currency trader. One comes to be a champion like he was a year ago. Another to reprove his strategy works. A woman tries to join the all-time greats. Then there are those proven athletes who now so desperately want what winning here will say about them. But they are the minority. The everyman is a soldier fighting a new battle. A nun riding into the sunset. A firefighter embracing a blaze and a total embrace of the word ability. What happens now changes lives every year. It all starts in the pre-dawn hours. And no one competing this year has enjoyed the success of 39-year-old Natasha Bodman of Switzerland. That's good, thank you. Last year, she tied Dave Scott and Mark Allen with her sixth win. That's only two wins behind Paula Newby Frazier's all-time record. Last year, she ran down McKeeley Jones, who was making her Iron Man debut. Now Jones is back, and she's trained by none other than Paula Newby Frazier. Jones has triathlon experience, having won the silver medal in the Sydney Olympics, but this is only her fourth race at this distance. While a select few have thoughts of winning in Kona, most just want to finish. 76-year-old sister Madonna Buter is back for her 20th Ironman. The lasting image of the 2005 Ironman was John Blaze. He finished the race with ALS and said, I'm going to finish under my own power or they're going to have to roll me across the finish line. Well, he did it under his own power. Twelve months later, his ALS has advanced. He's confined to a wheelchair, facing certain death. My focus coming back here this year was to bring the war on ALS to Kona. You know, talk about a disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, that not many people know much about. They don't know how hideous the disease is. I mean, the fact that I did the race last year, here I am sitting now in a wheelchair like I predicted. Next year, I won't be sitting in front of any cameras. I'll be gone. His name is Brian Breen. He's from Chicago. When he watched last year's show, he didn't know John Blaze. What he did know is that he was inspired to try and do something an Iron Man would do. Well, first off, <laughs> I made some calls to see that, uh, that, that, that I could do this, that I could go from, you know, 186, 185 pound, kind of out of shape, uh, non-trained, regular guy, average man, to an Iron Man in about six, five, six months. Then I went out trying to basically find John Blaze uh, through the internet. When I, found his, uh, when I found his email address, I just sent him a real simple email, and I just said, look, I'm going to Kona, how can I help? I got an email from Brian back in July. And at that point, I, was, I lost the ability really to type well on the computer. So I just said, hey, you know, I typed in, hey, please give me a call. A little later on that day, the phone rang, and he was like, well, I won a lottery slot. His first time out, he won a lottery slot, and he wanted to come in a race uh, for a cause that was bigger than himself. Taking that baby to the finish line right there. 
So I said, well, if you consider racing from you know Team Blazeman and myself, I said I, I think we can make something, make something happen that the world that the world will hear. A world that thankfully has a Brian Breen in it. The men's defending world champion is Germany's Faris Al Sultan. Sometimes they say the finish is just a blur of emotions. How about a total blackout? My crossing the finish line, I don't have any rem remembrance of that. It's completely gone. L long after I've won, you know, I was having a shower and then, you know, it, it, it popped up like, hey, you really did that? Finishing the Ironman is major. Winning, extraordinary. Repeating, well, everything has to go right. Just ask 2004 champion Norman Stadler. He had a two flat tire experience last year and his chances of repeating were done. A meltdown ensued. You can understand Stadler putting in a little bit more preparation time at the bike racks. 32-year-old Australian Chris McCormack. He has been a leader during the race. But he has horror stories after that. One of my experiences here have been brutal, to be honest. I came here, I think every year I've started this race as one of the favourites. And I've been so successful at every other race I've ever done, and this one has just seemed to haunt me. Last year was his best finish ever, sixth place. Final preparations for Switzerland's Natasha Bodman. Her competition includes Australia's Michele Jones, who after not making the Australian Olympic team prior to Athens, decided to go long distance. I swore and swore and swore until 2004, there's no way you would ever, ever see me do an Ironman. But you know, it's cool, I, I know why people do Ironman. Michele was a major player in short distance triathlons for 16 years, but this is a different ball game. Up and comer, Desiree Ficker from Texas. This is the best part. <laughs> Her preparation included arriving at the pier before everyone, including the volunteers. Cannon goes off when you feel like you want to throw up and you're nervous. And I usually like to take some big deep breaths just to get everything settled. Before the cannon goes off, everybody's nervous. Everyone's wondering how they're going to feel on this day that they've prepared so hard for. In the morning, I wake up and I just I feel so nervous. And you have the butterflies in your stomach, the anticipation of what's going to happen. But as soon as I jump in the water, I just have this calm that goes over me. It's pretty emotional at the start, and you'd think after racing so many times, it wouldn't be, it'd just be a piece of cake, but there's something about it, you almost want to cry just before the start of the race. In many of my Ironmans, I get very emotional at the beginning because, you know, I'm not going to see the people who I love <laughs> for maybe nine hours, and I'm going to have to push myself to beyond limits of pain. Everybody before the race feels some you know, something is pinching here and not working 100% there, and, but this is just the, the, the usual nervousness before the race and you know, as soon as the cannon goes off, everything's cured and you're a 100% race machine. Like everyone else, we, we want to get going. You know, just before the gun goes off, you're just like, come on, hurry up. The elite competitors are given a head start from the rest of the 1,800 people who make up the race. Too many times, overzealous back of the Packers have gotten in the way. Not anymore.
The moments right before the start for the rest of the field are eerie. Few words are spoken. They say nervous people get like that. Beginning of that swim, it is scary as all get out. The swim is probably the point where I feel the most anxiety. It's scary out there. It's a feeding frenzy. There's nobody out there that's your friend. It's a small corridor of 1,800 athletes with all this pent up emotion and they're ready to go and you're just standing in their way. Slapping you back, pulling on your legs. It's a washing machine. Elbows and arms and kicking and screaming. It's like a cross between swimming and wrestling. I'm not a strong swimmer, so, you know, I, I tend to be sort of where the bulk of the people are and, um, and that tends to be a little more physical. There's water in your lungs, there's uh, spray in your face, you got feet, elbows, everything slapping you in the face. And people climb right over your back and kick you, and that's just the women. And in everyone's effort to go forward, you are being hit, you're being kicked, you are just trying to stay calm. After the frantic start, the swimmers find a line and then realization hits, 2.4 miles to go. Near the front of the pros is last year's champion, Faris Al-Sultan, out to defend. Millions have been touched by these two. That's Dick Hoyt and his son, Rick. Cerebral palsy hasn't stopped him from getting a full education and sharing an active life with his dad. From the Boston Marathon to here, they've started and finished them all. But it's been seven years since they last finished here, and that was the second time they had done it. This year, something is very different. This is definitely going to be our last Ironman. Our goals for the 2006 Ironman Triathlon is, first of all, to complete it. We haven't really set a time that we'd like to do. We just want to be able to finish it. To do that, they have to beat the cutoff time, like everybody else. All the swimmers have spread out and are in the midst of a grueling 2.4 mile swim. Soon, for the pros, time to get out of the water and get on the bike as fast as possible. The symbolic first swimmer to hit land is Francisco Olo Pantano of Spain. He's a symbol of soon to get caught. That's Linda Gallo, only seven seconds later. But like so many who lead the swim, they end up fading because it is a three-pronged race. A collegiate swimmer, Joanna Zeiger, is right there. She always is. One minute later, Australian Olympian McKeely Jones enters the mix. And Zeiger clearly wants the prestige of being first out. Last year's champion, Faris Al-Sultan, assesses his competition. There are probably 20 guys out there that are physically able to win the race. And if you see us train together, I mean, there's not much difference. Pantano is first on the bike. But Al-Sultan is right there. As is Australian Chris McCormack. Joanna Zeiger has taken the women's lead with a quick transition. Now, her land legs need to get with the program. Next is last year's second place finisher, McKeeley Jones. Prior to last year, she suffered a bike accident where she wasn't able to train for six weeks. Well, compared to last year when I fractured my hip and didn't quite get the run training that I needed, definitely this year is 100% better. 
Jones made the change to this Ironman distance at 36 and finished second. Now 37. Some think that's a little late for a breakthrough. Emerging from the water with all the men in the blue caps is Texan Desiree Ficker. She's trying to become the first American woman to win the Ironman Triathlon World Championship in eight years. My swimming is, is the weak spot, and I think mentally that's where I'm probably the weakest because I didn't grow up swimming, and I sort of had to learn, uh, you know, at a, I started swimming when I was 22, and it's just taken a few years to build up the confidence. So Desiree's only been a swimmer for seven years, but she's among the elite women because that's Kate Major, who finished in third last year. They say you can't win the Ironman in the swim, but you can lose it. It applies to Natasha Bodman, the winner last year and in six of the last eight, comes out of the water 12 minutes behind the leaders. Historically, she's been great on the bike and strong in the run. And she's going to need all that today. In spite of her trouble, her resume gets into the mind of everybody. I think she just focuses on the right thing. <laughs> you know, she focuses within. And we're all still busy, you know, looking at something else or worrying about where she is. <laughs> you know? And she's just going on her way. She just keeps going forward. And we're with like, oh, he's Natasha. Oh, he's Natasha coming, you know. Um, and I think that's why she's winning. If the top women are going to look for Bodman, they need to turn around because she's in 34th place out of the water. Last year, she had the fifth fastest bike in Ironman history. Then there was another one she never finished and got sick. You never know. Step one is done for Brian Breen in his Ironman debut. A quick hello to John Blaze, and he's off. A year ago, that's where Blaze was headed. The swim cutoff is two hours and 20 minutes. 76-year-old Madonna Booter is good to go. Feisty lady. This guy kept nudging me and nudging me and I thought, you know, I'm getting tired of this. And I thought, oh, I could so easily pull your goggles off. The thought must have transferred to him because I never saw him again. <laughs> now it's a 112 mile bike ride for sister Madonna Booter and everybody better stay out of her way. The Hoyts approach the pier in this their final Ironman. Dick has helped Ricky's physical imagination lift his spirit beyond what his body will allow and think that he is doing this and that they are doing it together. All they want to do is finish, but they are past the cutoff time and someone has to deliver the harshest news of the day. Well, Dick, you know what? It was a tough day out there on the swim for everybody, not just you guys. But you did it. You pulled it through. And I'll tell you what, every time it just must be an incredible thrill for you to do this for yourself. In sports, athletes retire, and they do so with memories of their greatest days. For Dick and Ricky, this is one of them to cherish. 1999, when the two of them came to Kona to suffer in the heat of the Queen K, like everybody else. They watched the sun set over the Pacific and did not stop. When he was born, doctors said Rick was doomed to a life of darkness. Yet here, they emerged to the bright light of a different place. One where they became Iron Men forever. I get my inspiration from Rick, there's no doubt about it. He, he inspires me and, and he motivates me. He's the athlete and I'm just loaning him my arms and my legs. People with disabilities, 
should be able to live like everybody else and they should be able to do things that everybody else does. They should be able to be involved in sports. They should be able to go to movies. They should be able to go to college. You know, they should be able to do everything that we all can do and, and enjoy life. And, and if people just realize that the people with disabilities are people too. You can learn a lot about life on the Big Island of Hawaii. At this year's Ford Ironman World Championship, the conditions are uncharacteristically calm. At the beginning of the bike, the historically brutal winds are non-existent. The legend Mark Allen said he never saw it like this, and that if you're ever going to go fast, today is the day. No one is taking advantage of these conditions more than the 2004 champion Norman Stadler. The German is known for being strong on the bike, that is, when it's working. Now some athletes have selective amnesia, others remember every game. Does Stadler allow himself to even think about what happened a year ago? I'm a flat tire! It was my seventh race here in Hawaii and it happened the first time that I had a flat tire, so I wasn't prepared for that. I couldn't get the tire off and I was waiting for the support car and that it takes forever if you wait on the on the road and your, your competitors they fly by. But you know as a defending champion did not finish is not good. This then is his new chance and Stadler is blowing by the competition knowing he has to build a lead large enough to survive the men who can quite simply run faster than he does. Chris McCormack, whose Ironman history has been a learning experience. You know, a lot of people got upset because of what I said, you know, but I've said that I came here and said I want to win the race. And everyone's like, oh, you can't do that. You've never, you haven't paid your dues. It's such an American word, paying your dues. And I thought, man, I've been doing this sport for seven years. I've paid my dues well and truly. I'm paid up in full. A lot of people call me cocky. I think a lot of the Americans misinterpret who I am. Anyone who knows me, I'm, I'm the least cockiest person in the world. I'm just passionate about this sport. You know, I grew up admiring the champions, not disrespecting them. I, I had pictures of Mark Allen and Dave Scott on my bedroom wall. Why would I ever disrespect what they did? Rock bottom for McCormack on Kona came early in his first year. I had a 13 minute lead off the bike and I ran out of town, I high fived my father and said, I'll see you in two and a half hours and we'll, uh, we'll go out for a couple of beers and we'll bank this check and I absolutely melted out, out in the lava fields and failed to finish and I went home utterly disappointed, couldn't believe it. You know, I think I disrespected, not so much the distance in the race, but I disrespected how tough the Hawaiian Ironman is. You know, there was a lot of happy people when I failed and, and maybe, it was the, maybe it was the best thing that happened to me because I think that it's the failures that will make the success so much better. Had I come here and won this race on debut, I probably wouldn't be the athlete I am today. Those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it, but Chris McCormack remembers. Now McKeely Jones is getting serious, picking off the competition one at a time and in rapid succession. Here she passes Gina Kerr at a speed sure to crack her spirit. Next in the crosshairs is the leader, Joanna Zeiger. And it happens quickly. You can almost hear Zeiger say, doesn't she know this is the Iron Man? For years, McKeely was the dominant triathlete in the world, but at the Olympic distances and shorter, this is four times that at 140 miles. Obviously, that changes the game of training and preparation enormously, but McKeely is a smart athlete. So she got on the Iron Man learning curve with the greatest woman to ever do this. Paula Newby Frazier. 
She's done her homework. Last year, everyone was shocked when she decided to do this race. Now, after a second place finish, she's hooked. I guess I'm not one of those people who grew up thinking, you know, I want to do the Ironman one day. I was one of those people who was like, are you kidding? There's no way I want to do that. And I think a lot of it was I didn't think I could do it. You know, I was totally a short course athlete. You know, that's what I wanted to do. Fast, fast, fast. That was me all over. And then I didn't make the Olympic team in 2004. So it was one of those decisions where my husband sort of threw it out there and suggested I, you know, do a half Ironman and I did quite well in there. And with the help of Paula Newby Fraser, you know, she, she helped me get through my first Ironman. And, you know, it's one of those things that I swore and swore and swore until 2004. There's no way you would ever, ever see me do an Ironman. But you know, it's cool. I, I know why people do Ironmans right now, you know. Running down a Leahy Drive last year was awesome. I mean, winning an Olympic silver medal was fantastic. But you know, running down a Leahy Drive, doing something that I never thought I would do, just like I never thought I would do the Olympics, you know, that's what makes this whole experience really unique to me. Having Paula Newby Frazier become her Yoda looks great. McKaylee Jones is in front. Even more dangerous to the field is that the Aussie at 37 knows plenty of her own tricks of the trade. From the front to the back of the pack, where there's a different kind of race for Trisha Downing. And yet another reminder that just training can change everything. Prior to the accident, I was a competitive cyclist on the road and the track, so I was used to putting in a lot of hours and a lot of miles and training nearly every day. I was hit by a car on a training ride. I was hit head on and flipped up into the windshield and shattered my back and um, impacted my spinal cord. I had lost completely all the use of my trunk muscles and my stomach muscles, so even sitting up was something that I had to relearn to do. And I didn't realize that until the first day when my physical therapist had me lying flat on a mat and she said, okay, today we're gonna learn how to sit up. And I thought, what do you mean we're gonna learn how to sit up? I know how to sit up. And she's like, okay, go. And I went to sit up and nothing responded and I didn't move. It was then when I realized I'm really hurt. I really have a problem here. For me, this race is going to be about making the time cut on the bike. That's really all I'm focusing on right now because if I don't make that time cut, I don't hit the finish line. But if I do make that time cut, I was planned to enjoy the whole marathon, have a great time, slow down, talk to people, drink at aid stations, and, and when I'm done, I can't even tell you how I'll feel. I just hope from there. This is John Blaze. He's going to die. Soon. It's ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. This year he's in a wheelchair. Last year he finished the Ironman. Brian Breen watched that and wanted to honor John's cause. So he spoke to John's dad and he said, Whether you come aboard or not, I want you to understand, you know, we're not trying to, to, to reach out and grab you and make you do this for our cause. This, is, this Ironman experience is going to be the greatest experience you've ever had in your life. And he said, look, you know, my, you know, my son and I, we're, we're, we're looking to get some, to build a team. If you want to be part of this team, we're not asking for a lot. We're not asking for you to raise a million dollars or raise $10,000. We need awareness. We need people to hear this story, and we need people to continue to tell this story. And so that's it. And now, Brian is part of the team. Well, if you guys get a chance to see John, tell him I said I'm thinking about him. On another part of the Big Island, it's raining. On 76-year-old sister, Madonna Buter, competing in her 20th Ironman. Meanwhile, during every stroke of Trisha Downing, all she's thinking about is making the cutoff. She has until 5.30 p.m. Keely Jones is still leading the women's race. The 37-year-old Australian has lived in Carlsbad, California since 1991 with her husband and coach, Pete Coulson. Remember, 
this was his idea. When she was winning or not, it was impossible not to notice the smile on the face of Natasha Vodman. This time, no smile. That swim put her far behind, and while she's moved up to 11th place, she still trails McKeeley Jones by 12 minutes. Norman Stadler is still rocking across the lava fields, and nobody on record can beat him on wheels. The huge bonus is that there's no heat from the sun for the lava to absorb and turn this place into a sauna. And there's no wind. It's like everybody hit the Iron Man weather lottery. Last year's champion Faris Al Sultan is in second, leading a pack of pursuers, which includes Aussie Chris McCormack, whose strength is in the run. This is David Rosell, weighs close to 200 pounds, plays rugby. Six pack to him is about beer and not abs. But he's different than everyone out here for another reason. In Ironman terms, anyone over 200 pounds is called a Clydesdale, except this one is called a hero. On the 21st of June, 2003, uh, you know, I was a cavalry troop commander in Iraq. Um, although I wasn't uh, commanding 200 men in combat that day, I was actually headed to teach a police academy and only had about four vehicles, about 30 men and a convoy headed uh, as the advance party to teach this police academy. While en route, uh, I ran over a, uh, a landmine. I spent a lot of time explaining what it felt like to, to be blown up, uh, but it's exactly as you imagine it. It's just a moment of just chaos. I tried to, to evacuate myself, and I put my foot out the, I put my, what was left of my leg out the vehicle, uh, and I was pushing on the ground to try to pull my left leg free. And as I did that, I, I saw, I looked down and saw uh, blood and bone coming out my boot, which explains why it felt mushy. And that's when I realized I was injured. I didn't feel like a hero when I came home. There were people who wanted me to feel like a hero when I got home, but I didn't feel like a hero when I got home because I was severely injured. I mean, I'd left my men, you know, someone else was in command of them. All those women and children who I had looked at before leaving and said, I will take care of your husband. I'm gonna get him home safe. But there was a period there where uh, I didn't hide it very well, and that was at about the four-month mark. You know, the actualization occurred. Um, I realized that I was literally setting my alarm clock so I could take huge amounts of pain medicine in the middle of the night um, and throughout the day, and then started mixing it with alcohol. And man, that's really when the road got bumpy. It's, to me, it's healthy to, to mourn your, the loss of your limb. However, if you uh, can't get over it, you've got some real problems. That feeling went on for two months. Then he got the mail one day and noticed a letter to his wife in his own handwriting. And I realized as I held it in my hand, looking at the date of it, that it was two days before I was injured and could have been killed. And that if she had found that after I'd been killed, this would be the last communication with me. And as I opened it up and as I read through what I would have said to her uh, in my last letter, I mean, it just, uh, it just ripped me apart. And it was, uh, it was that moment where I realized that, man, I, just, I gotta get my act together. He got back to where he was able to return to the military. Then Roselle got the word. The Army wanted him to become the first amputee to return to the same battlefield where he got injured. But he needed to clear it by his superiors at home. And I went home and I mentioned to camp. I said, I just got to tell you, so I don't get in trouble later, but I don't have to go. And she looked at me and she said, just without even thinking, she said, you have to go. Because if you don't go, David, you'll spend the rest of your life wondering if you could have done it. And you're never going to feel like you've beat this thing unless you go back to the place you're injured and you prove that you can do it. So you're going. After two more years in Iraq, he returned to Virginia where he now works at Walter Reed Hospital, helping other wounded vets with their road to recovery. You get a kick out of it? I haven't seen you in a while. I do these races for the guys that are laying in the bed feeling sorry for themselves. 
And I always think about those that didn't come home. And I think about their families, I think about their kids. Just get it in the building, so. And I think about the fact that they're never coming home. And uh, if I ever need strength in a race, man, I, I reach inside and, and uh, think about those guys because, you know, they can't, they can't compete. And uh, so I do it for them. I always do it for them. On his bike of stars and stripes, Army Major David Roselle pumps toward the halfway point of the bike. And he's like every fan out there. How the leaders doing? Are they fast? Oh, they're fast. Yeah. The norm is like about seven minutes ahead. Is he really? Yeah. Fast, baby. <laughs> the bike. And on that bike, Norman Stadler is flying. The conditions are perfect. No wind, and it's overcast. Six-time champion Mark Allen said he's never felt it this cool. On a normal day here, the trade winds would be cruel, but it's like the island gods are asleep. Stadler hits the turnaround at Javi with a record time on the bike in his sights. McKeeley Jones is still leading the women's race, and like Stadler, has been the leader since early on on the bike. But someone else is flying and starting to make up time, Natasha Bodman. Turns 40 in December, but she's not ready to relinquish anything yet. The competitors here range from professional triathletes to lawyers to doctors and many teachers. But there's only one adventure racer who happens to be a female firefighter. I'm not a triathlete. I'm a Rottweiler competing with, with a bunch of greyhounds. Robin Benacasa has started and finished this race three times before. Iron Man taught me how to be hard, how to be just mentally hard and to suffer. And I took that and brought it to adventure racing. Alrighty then, it's you and me, Cole. She's been a top adventure racer for 12 years. I mean, to me, it's just so, there's a, a few neat things about Iron Man that you don't get in an adventure race. First of all, you're standing there at the start line going, I am gonna be in a bed tonight. This, I haven't had in 12 years. I mean, my races are six days long, so the prospect of standing there at the start line going, I'm gonna be in a bed tonight with a meal in my stomach, that's huge. I mean, that's so, that's so wonderful mentally to know it's gonna be over at the end of the day. It's exciting. And I'm spent. Before she can sleep in her bed tonight, this firefighting Rottweiler will have to cover 120 miles. I think I'm winning. There's a trademark of the Big Island the competitors can't see, but it can sneak up on you and make life miserable. So far it's been missing, but now it's back. The wind, it makes it tougher. There's no doubt about it. It does make it tougher. You have to be really conservative in certain areas. It's a long day, so you don't want to, you know, give up all your energies. Winds come in, they hit the mountains, and the mountains act as a funnel at 13,000 feet. Only in Hawaii we have those winds, so, but that's Hawaii. Wait, I'm pedaling hard, I'm going downhill. Why am I not going, you know, 25, 28, 30 miles an hour? What is going on? It can feel like you're biking into a wall and that you're not really moving forward. When I make that turn up to Harvey, I look and see if there's any white caps. <laughs> if there's white caps, I know it's gonna be a tough, tough wind day. The winds that we tend to get out on the far end of the course here are the crosswinds. Ah, the crosswinds, where you feel like you're going to die because you feel like you're going to get thrown off your bike. They're the type that you can't prepare for. You don't know when they're going to come at any time, and it's a gust of wind that will just throw you totally to one side or the other. I have seen 140, 150 pound men picked up and thrown across the road, literally. Boom! I've seen tires roll off rims before because of the wind, because you're leaning so hard into the wind that literally the glue on the tire gives an 
and the tires come off the rims and the guys end up falling because basically the tires come apart. Trees are bending sideways and people have been blown off their bikes. You blow right across the road, across a lane. It plays mind games with you because you'll be going into a headwind and you'll think you're going to turn around and you're going to have a tailwind and you'll turn around and the wind's even stronger. What the hell? Did make this wind change from direction, or what, what's wrong with this course? Because you're still going the same direction. Okay, wind, stop blowing. Please stop blowing now. While the pros are nearing the finish of the bike, Ironman newcomers Brian Breen and Major David Roselle are left to struggle with these ever changing winds. Sister Madonna Buter knows to hold on tight. A few years ago, she got blown off her bike and broke her shoulder. And wind is no friend of Trisha Downing, as she's left to fight with it to make it to the bike cutoff by 5.30. Meanwhile, Norman Stadler has come roaring into town and he's made history. He's covered the 112 mile bike course in four hours and 18 minutes. His time on the bike is the fastest in Ironman history. In 2004, Stadler became the first to break through and essentially win because of the bike time cushion. Now, the Ironman says, okay, do it again. Time check. Stadler has a seven minute lead over the next cyclist and 10 over his biggest threat. And finally, the pack trickles into town. American cyclist Chris Lieto is in second. He's won Ironman races before, but never the world championship. Aussie Chris McCormack is right there. So is last year's champion Faris Al Sultan. The big question for all is when do you push it? The key to success here is patience. I think this event has taught me to be patient. So, yeah, if I'm still there with, uh, if I get off the bike in the hunt, yeah, we could, we could have a night on the drink. McCormick is confident because he has a running pedigree, but he's facing that 10 minute deficit beginning the marathon of 26.2 miles. McKeeley Jones is still in front. With each revolution, she must be thinking about last year, how she couldn't hold off Natasha Bodman, who made up more than nine minutes on the run. She needs to increase her lead, somehow, some way. The men's race in the Ford Ironman World Championship is about to leave town. Ten miles in and it's turning into a two-man event. Norman Stadler's lead is eight and a half minutes over Chris McCormack. The Aussie has been near the lead at this point before, but in his words, he's crumbled. He's been quoted as saying, I consider myself the best runner in the sport. Well, today, in order to win, he's going to have to be just that. The women's race reaches transition two as well, and it's just like last year. McKeeley Jones is first off the bike in a time of five hours, six minutes, nine seconds. Not many are on pace to beat that. All the while, Switzerland's Natasha Bodman is making up time. It looks like she'll gain five or six minutes. As she leaves for the marathon, McKeeley Jones has to be thinking of making this time different from last time. In her first attempt at the World Championship in Kona, Jones led off the bike but couldn't hold off Bodman, who made up more than nine minutes on the run. Bodman passed her at mile 18 and never looked back en route to her sixth title. This time, Bodman gets off the bike with the second fastest time for the women. She made up seven minutes, six seconds on Jones, better than thought. Texan Desiree Ficker with the fourth fastest time. And then Joanna Zeiger filters in. Last year, Bodman made up nine minutes on the run. This year, she's only 5.35 behind heading into the marathon. But McKeeley Jones has more than Bodman to worry about. Seven women are within six and a half minutes. She simply has to be better than last year. Mark Harriman's was a professional triathlete. He finished in sixth place in his first Ironman in 2001. 
Then he was hit by a car while training and broke his back, leaving him paralyzed from the chest down. He's finished the Ironman as a challenged athlete, but now he wants to win the physically challenged division with the body that he has. I know if I win the race and I have a very good time, I quit triathlon and um, I start my third life because my first life ended four years ago when I broke my back. This is my second life and if I quit triathlon, um, if I reach my goal, then I can start my third life. Mark Hermans knows the agony of missing a time cutoff. When your day is over, regardless of your dream. Now Trisha Downing does too. She won't make the 5.30 cutoff. Her Ironman ends early. For the second time in his life, Norman Stadler is trying to prove that years of history are wrong. Build up a big lead on the bike, then hang on through the marathon. In 2004, it worked for the first time. Now, the competition is wary and maybe cocky that the old way still works. Be solid, be steady, and don't have a weakness in any of the three disciplines. Chris McCormack, he has his own history issues here that he hopes will not apply. Well, I came from a short course background, racing the Olympics and those sort of events, and, and I just used to sit here and watch the NBC coverage at home in, the, in my lounge room with the air conditioning on and you, you cut a 17 hour race program into one hour coverage with beautiful music and some lovely stories and it looked easy. It really did and I, uh, I, I came here just expecting to get out in those lava fields and that nice music would kick in and, and I'd float to the finish line and it would all be rosy dory and here we go, I can go home and bank the cheque and, and, and rejoice my win and uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't turn out like that. As Makili Jones leaves the town of Kailua Kona, she does so as race leader. To get her legs ready for this, she entered and then won three half Ironmans this year. Sounds like a plan. She looks strong, but sometimes when runners start doing things with towels or sponges and ice, it could be a sign of system overload. Now, if Makili could see behind her, she might say, uh-oh because the smile is back on the face of Natasha Bodman. Now, last year, she ran a 3.06 marathon to catch McKeeley Jones. She'll need an effort like that again. By the way, there's a reason behind all of Natasha's smiles. So when I started doing triathlon, I became a very happy, very satisfied person. And this is something that I want to share with everybody who wants to have a piece of it. So um, here I am, and I smile as long as I feel that it feels good. The smile is short-lived. Suddenly, Natasha is limping on a Lee Drive. You rock, Natasha! You're a but she rallies with a, hey, let's do this. Her marathon continues, and she makes use of the hydration station. Hard to believe, but hours after it happened, she is still dealing with the deficit from the swim. McKeeley Jones is unaware of the Bodman developments. It seems like she is in that long distance induced zone of concentration, focusing on what she feels like. Not only is Bodman not catching McKeeley Jones, she's being caught by Desiree Ficker. Bodman's first Ironman was 1996. Ficker was only 19 and a sophomore at Alabama on a track scholarship. This has that passing of the guard kind of feeling. Desiree Ficker, you just passed a Hall of Famer in the Ironman. Now Bodman has never finished out of the top two positions in her Ironman career but that might be happening.
It's a double dose of reality for Bodman. She's passed by Gina Kerr. Meanwhile, the men's race has dropped the defending champion. It's come down to a two-man showdown. Norman Stadler, Germany. Chris McCormack, Australia. I am a professional triathlete. This is my fourth Ironman. I'm a former world champion. A win comes about by making a gutsy move in the critical point of a race, and sometimes people aren't prepared to do that. And you have to be prepared to take that move, make it, and pay the ultimate price. If you don't, it's not the right move, and um, I'm prepared to do that. It's a race to crown a world champion. And it's a two-man show. Two men who, for the last time, get a chance to look each other in the eye. Check the clock and decide what's possible. When this marathon began, Chris McCormack was down 10 minutes to Norman Stadler. Now it's four and a half. Twenty-three miles into the race, the deficit continues to fall, but an added opponent is the legendary heat of the late afternoon on the big island of Hawaii. It's time to do the math. McCormack is now 250 behind. He needs to be 35 seconds faster in each of the remaining miles to finish side by side with the German. McCormack's mile pace is 625. Stadler's is 711. And Stadler's not slow, but the Aussie is fast. Two point two miles to go. McCormack is 90 seconds behind. He can see the chopper above Stadler, and he can probably see Stadler himself. Still, he seems confident as he returns to town. McCormack clearly is giving everything. Winning this race for a pro is a career changer. On the final descent, Stadler hears a coach's pleadings. The difference is a little over a minute. Lava sounds hot, and it is. McKeeley Jones is still in front of the women's race, and comfortably so. But there is nothing comfortable about the environment. Everybody is paying back for the good conditions earlier in the day. Her lead is over five minutes. Pursuers include American Desiree Ficker, who is actually running a faster marathon pace than Jones. Her coach is three-time Ironman champion Peter Reed, but Reed can talk for hours about the heat of this place and not get the message accurately across. It's something you have to feel to believe. It's, it's oppressive, and the heat and humidity here is just, I live in Austin, Texas, and it's, it's much, much worse, and people always talk about you know, how hot and humid it is there, but you know, it's, it can be pretty brutal. There are times out on the run where you just, you wish that there was one long continuing aid station, you know, providing you ice and water. Even though they have an aid station every mile giving you ice and water, you, it just, it's amazing how long those miles can seem in between because it can be so hot.
Eventually, you pay, and Desiree Ficker does. On the Queen K Highway, Gina Kerr arrives as if officially announcing a return to the game. A one-time seventh place finisher here, she's returning from having a baby and a collision with a mountain biker. It's a good news, bad news, good news kind of thing. Way back at the Bike to Run transition, Iraq veteran Major David Roselle is about to experience what it's like to run 26.2 miles on his replaced foot. Funny thing, without the prosthetic, he'd never even be here. Yeah, if I hadn't if I hadn't had this traumatic injury, man, there's no way I'd do it, man. I mean, I'm a rugby player. You know, if triathletes could make it in the same bar that I made into, you know, we would have given nothing but a hard time to the skinny little fellas that couldn't carry a, a rugby ball on the pitch. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in a different sport. I'm hanging out with guys that you know, shave their legs and arms and stuff, and, and uh, wear spandex and, and talk about which fibers work better in water. And, and, uh, and eat tofu, you know, it's just, it's a different world. Mark Harriman's dream of winning the hand cycle division is alive. As he leaves T2, he knows a win today, he's retiring and moving on. All the everymen are starting to trickle in as well. First year competitor Brian Breen made the bike cutoff. Now, he faces a late afternoon marathon all in the name of John Blaze. Norman Stadler has methodically made it into town. The finish line is slowly approaching. But Chris McCormack isn't doing anything slowly. He knows the time for patience is long gone. In the past, Kona has smacked Chris McCormack around, and hard. But this day, he's fighting back, conquering the island and the race. He's made up over nine minutes over the course of this marathon. Unfortunately, he needed to make up over 10 to catch Norman Stadler. For Stadler, it's his second time. Officially, the separation is 1 minute 11 seconds, one of the top three closest finishes in the history of the race. As always, there is sportsmanship and respect. McCormick, he did a, such a great race today, and uh, I was scared in the end, but you know, I won by one and a half minutes. Last year's champion, Faris Al Sultan, is next. And Stadler is there for him, too, waiting seven minutes and eight seconds for him to get there. Germany has had a good day. At the last aid station, Akili Jones is a good customer. Whatever they're selling, she's buying. The Iron Man takes everyone to their limit. Behind Jones, something is happening that almost never does. A pass getting undone. Desiree Ficker was overtaken by Gina Kerr. Now she prepares to recapture her spot in the standings. McKeeley Jones can feel it. The crowds are roaring, the air is cooling, and her world championship becoming real. Now she has a smile of her own. 
but the top three is in flux again, as Gina Kerr has been passed by Lisa Bentley, who's on pace to be the only woman to run the marathon under 310. The smile thing is contagious, as Desiree Ficker begins to realize that finishing second to Makili Jones is pretty cool. One last check to be sure. On a Lee drive at the age of 37, Makili Jones has one of her greatest thrills. considering I never ever thought I would do an Ironman. It, it's pretty unbelievable and you know, I have so many people to thank. I couldn't have done it without Paul and Jimmy Fraser, without my husband Pete. You know, it's just an amazing feeling. I never ever thought I'd be running down Leahy Drive and, and then to win, it's like absolutely amazing. You never know with Natasha Bodman. This is what the great champion looks like finishing 10th. We all know what happens next. The hopes and dreams of all the others begins to play out. The ones that belong to the people who tomorrow probably have to start thinking about going back to work. For all the different reasons they came here, Getting to the finish is the only thing that can validate the cause. The cause has an effect, emotional and physical. And here at the finish line, what has begun is a parade that will last until midnight. Ford Motivational Mile helps them get there. The party at the finish, the one where you can finally say, I am an Iron Man, is still far away for some, like hours away. When day gives way to night, you find the most precarious hopes. Like Major David Roselle. Last year, John Blaze was out there on his way to becoming an Iron Man himself. That was after he was given the death sentence of ALS. He's working on building an army out there to raise awareness and bring hope to his world of bleak. One soldier who actually recruited himself was Brian Breen. He's running so that John Blaze is never forgotten. This, however, is his first. Is there any chance of quitting? There's no chance. There's no chance. They'd have to drag me off the horse unconscious. And then some. On my training runs, especially on my bricks, where I've, you know, gone off and done a four or five hour bike and a, you know, a two hour run or whatever, it, it, it's, uh, it's gotten emotional for me because uh, I, I, I don't know how everybody else does it, but for me, I run on emotion, I run on passion. That's what, that's what drives me. You know, when I was younger, when I was in high school, the guys used to say that Green can't practice. He's in practice, I'd get beat by the fifth guy in the team. But on a race, no one can touch me. That's where I live, there's a, there's a corner. And it's, and it's like 200 yards to the house. And when I come around that corner, I can see John. And there's no stopping me. Before last year's race, John Blaze and Brian Breen never heard of each other. The disease that brought them together will soon tear them apart. But today, this is what Brian Breen can do about it.
as long as they're out there and until midnight, nobody leaves until the last Iron Man is welcomed home. Robin Benincasa. I'm a firefighter. I am 39. For real. Okay. <laughs> this is my fourth Iron Man. Sister Madonna Buter. 76 years old. This is my 20th Iron Man. I'm a nun. David Roselle. This is my first Iron Man. 34. I'm a major in the US Army. Mark Hermans. This is my sixth Iron Man. I'm 32 years old. I know if I win the race and I have a very good time, I quit triathlon and um, I start my third life because my first life ended four years ago when I broke my back. This is my second life and if I quit triathlon, um, if I reach my goal, then I can start my third life. The dream of his first life was shattered. The focus of his second comes true. Mark Harriman's enjoy your third life as an Ironman champion retired. As the race slows, you have time to be alone with your thoughts. If you are the president of the Florida Marlins baseball team, it's a pretty chaotic time. I'm a very big movie fan. I have a, uh, I have a movie show in Florida where I review movies, and the two Iron Man movies that I focus on are Forrest Gump and Rain Man. I am calculating as we speak the fact that it's 13.09, which means I've got three hours and 51 minutes to go approximately 10.6 miles. I want to be like Forrest Gump. I just want to keep going. But I'm definitely counting toothpicks right now. And I'm always like Rain Man because I'm counting toothpicks in the box and I'm figuring out exactly how much longer I have to go. So I've got three hours and 51 minutes to go approximately 10.6 miles, which means that if I walk at a pace of 20 minutes per mile, I'm going to be an Iron Man. I've been advised to keep your mind quiet, and I can't do it. I'm constantly doing the math of, well, if I'm going 17 miles an hour, I'll finish the bike in six hours and 42 minutes and 35 seconds, which will give me an extra hour before the cutoff, and I cannot control myself. I promised myself I'd far stump it, and I have. I just kept going, although I cried. I finish in the dark, you know, I'm one of those guys with the illuminated buttons on. I manage Willie Nelson, and uh, not very many managers do this. There's a stretch in the last six miles, last eight miles, where there's these huge telephone poles. And I can see the outlines of these telephone poles, and I, I alphabetize them and give each of them a letter and each letter dedicate to somebody in my life that motivates me, that's been kind to me, that has gotten me here. Those uh, telephone poles give me a chance to think about my colleagues, my loved ones, and, uh, and some I don't like. <laughs> I think about them too. People that say, ah, you shouldn't do it, you know? What are you wasting your time for? You're never gonna win one, you know? I think I give them a poll too, but I don't tell them where to put it. <laughs> uh, so that's why. Brian Breen, the banker from Chicago, is committed as well. He can see John Blaze at the finish line. Sister Madonna Buter, 76, here for a 20th time. It's now obvious she's battling the clock. She must be at the finish line by midnight, or it's as if this never happened.
the adventure-seeking firefighter has climbed another mountain. Robin will probably be back for more. The heavy rain helps hide the tears. Major Ozell, mission accomplished. Let the wounded see what's possible and how family can help bring you back. John Blaze, Brian Breen, finish ALS. That's all that matters now. I'm looking forward to being there at the finish line, waiting for him, you know, come midnight. And uh, I'm going to lose it for sure. It's going to be emotional, that's for sure. It's going to be heavy duty. And uh, it's, it's going to be bittersweet because, you know, this is it. It's almost like in life, they say, well, you know, like I said, life's not a dress rehearsal. How do you get excited about something that, you know, is once it's over, it's over, and it's never gonna come again? So you gotta live in the moment, and that's, that's what I'll be doing, because I think heading back on that plane, I'll be thinking a lot about what went on here this year, and, uh, you know, uh, after that, it's, there's really nothing more that I can do as far as the warning outside. It's time to pass the torch. It's time, John. I think one of the best hours I've ever spent in watching a sports event has been from 11 to midnight, watching uh, people come across. Uh, that hour is pretty spectacular. Sports is at its best when it's transcendent, when a player's joy tells you it was more than just a game, like a movie only real, that the dream connected the heart to the soul and the participants were made better for it for all their private and spoken reasons. When will and skill combine to make great, in that final hour here, it happens almost every second. Stadler win this race? Yeah. And is it true that he already flew home and landed in Germany? Because that's the rumor I heard. It's unbelievable. The man on the left is Alberto Seriani from Italy, and the man on the right is Claudio Pellegrini, who doesn't have a number. You see, he's a guide for Seriani because Alberto is blind. and they have done this entire Ironman together. At 27, a rare disease took Alberto's sight completely. Thankfully, there is a Claudio Pellegrini in his life. They did all 112 miles on a tandem bike, helping Alberto continue a lifelong pursuit of being physically fit. It was the guide Pellegrini who had to convince Alberto that a blind man could do a triathlon. And in Milan, they finished their first one two years ago. Then slowly but surely, Pellegrini helped Alberto learn what he needed to know about triathlons.
which brings them to the same stage that decides who's best in the world. Is this the craziest thing ever, <laughs> this race? By the way, this is Jess. She's been awesome. We've been running together, talking. She's Susan Anton to my Dudley Moore. Or she's <laughs> Bo Derek to my Dudley Moore. Your choice. I haven't seen her in the light yet, so I don't know which. I just know she's tall. With his powerful belief of getting to the finish, Brian Breen has made it to town. Yeah! Every step has been for John Blaze. It was that same type of belief that Blaze had in himself a year before when he could still run, ride, and swim. That he would get to the finish if they had to roll him across. He rolled himself across. Can it really be just 365 days ago? Sadly, yes it can. I can't wait. I'm, I'm looking for that, that last 10 feet where all I'm going to do is just continue the story. It's just a continuation of the John Blaze story. So, you know, 10 feet from that line, I'm going to roll, and hopefully the world's watching again, and hopefully they hear him again. John Blaze can no longer take steps toward the destinations of his life. But if we keep moving forward to try and stop an insidious killer, then words become a legacy. For now, it's become a movement that is growing. Life's not a dress rehearsal, so you gotta live in the moment and that's there's really nothing more that I can do as far as the war in ALS. Now it's time to pass the torch. The 
the Iron Man begins just after dawn and ends at the stroke of midnight. After that, it's nice try. It's a mix of people from all walks, and that is exactly what Sister Madonna Buter is doing on a dark, lonely road. But as a member of the Iron Man Club, she knows that they're waiting for her. It's why she takes the next step. And she knows the deal about midnight. This is her 20th time. That puts the jump back in her step. Willie Nelson's manager is Mark Rothbaum, finishing a sixth time. Some of his friends don't understand it, but he so totally gets it. And when pitchers and catchers report in February, David Sampson can ask the Marlins if they can top this. I envision every day the race. I envision the finish line. And what drives me is to become the first ever team president to ever cross the finish line in Hawaii. First president of a major league franchise team in the United States, the Finnish Ironman Hawaii, David Sampson. You did it, buddy. What happens at the finish is an impossible to resist lure for the champion, Makili Jones. Hours after finishing, she returns to welcome everyone to the exclusive Ironman Club. And then there's Dick Hoyt, of course, with son Rick, to welcome Dick's younger brother, Jason, who is 55. Funny thing is that without Rick, there probably would be no Team Hoyt. And then, with everyone watching the tick, tick, tick and the empty road, Sister Madonna Buter appears. and it gives everyone hope for themselves. Sister Madonna, after 140 miles, had one minute to spare. I always have a, a, to have a purpose for doing something anymore. I have to have a reason to come back to Iron Man. I'm thinking, I drug the woman forward last year by being the pioneer to open the 75 to 79 age group for the women. Now I have to forge ahead to open it for them when I get 80. <laughs> you can learn a lot about life on the Big Island of Hawaii. Karen Smyers, Lincoln, Massachusetts. I'm a former champion. Chris McCormack. Australia. I am a professional triathlete. Robin Benincasa, part of California. This is my fourth Ironman. Mark Rothbaum. Don't you be following me in Six here. consecutive Ironman. Natasha Bartman, Switzerland. This is my tenth Ironman. Joe Bonas, 13th Ironman. I am 51 years old. Lori Bowden, 15th Ironman. I'm a two-time Ironman champion. Sister Madonna Buter, 76 years old. This is my 20th Iron Man. John Dermengian. I'm a foreign currency trader. I live for this. Trish Downing. Denver, Colorado. Teacher. David Roselle. I'm a major in the U.S. Army. Get some fish tacos up here at Howie. Desiree Ficker, Austin, Texas. This is my fourth Iron Man. Mark Hermans, Belgium. I am a motivational speaker. McKeeley Jones, Australia. I'm a professional triathlete. Norman Stadler, Germany. Wait, hold on, let's start again. <laughs> and now, everybody gets back to their real life. I am a waitress. Plumber. Contractor. FBI. Promises. Firefighter. Flight attendant. Air colors. A marine. Teacher. I am a lawyer. 
But for one day. But for one day. But for one day. I was an Iron Man.